This is Peter. And this is Tom. And you're listening to History Teachers Talking Podcasts. All right, this is Peter Sablaki and Thomas Reska, and welcome back to our podcast. Tommy, back together again, just the two of us. Just the two of us. No, I'm not going to say that. that. I know, you don't <laughs> like it when I sing. You know, I, I, like, I thought it would just add some, you know. <laughs> upbeat stuff to this although this is i think a pretty upbeat I, this I mean, is I don't somewhat know. Just, it depends it depends exactly you just asked me a very like philosophical questions about yeah. 10 seconds ago you asked me like sorry go ahead tommy what are we doing today well today we're gonna be looking at the uh decade known well the decade is known as it the decade of the 1950s and we're really yeah. gonna kind of look at it and kind of ponder the question like the 1950s has all these different all these different changes going on in the country in the world but it's also is it a decade of like conservatism complacency and contentment or is it a decade of anxiety, alienation, and social unrest? So kind of both of those can be argued. Yes. And I mean, quite frankly, oftentimes when you look at, like just scanning through chapters in American textbooks, it's often referred to as the fabulous 50s or the American dream in 1950s. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's always- But it wasn't It wasn't that for everybody. Yes. Like that's absolutely. something that's, you know, I don't think stressed a lot. Is if you, if you were a white male, it, it was probably great. Yep. Um, you know, for the most part. Even if you're a white female, you're a female, it was already down so so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't as good as the 40s, really. Well, you know, you couldn't work. You couldn't get work. And we'll get to that. But um, yeah, it wasn't this like awesome time period. Oh, I, would love, I would love to live. I think you've said it sometimes. You love to live in the 50s, right? Yeah. Just kind of like. Yeah, but then you always remind me. You're like, yeah, really? You want to live in the 50s? And then you oh, yeah. start like, pointing out all these bad things. And you're like. I would, yeah. I would never want to live in the 50s. Like, I mean, no, first of all, I enjoy you know, air conditioning a lot more and internet and you know stuff like that. But on my streaming services, I, I like you know, some social, like, like bomb could drop on us, you know, the, the Soviets might oh, come. Yeah. Plus, I, I mean, I sound foreign and I'm from the Eastern Bloc, so I would never be accepted by any way, shape or form. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you, you would be arrested during this. And I'm Catholic. Yeah. I'm a Catholic immigrant. Like this would just be, <laughs> this would just not yeah. be good. You know, it done. wasn't as You're tolerant. Done. You're right. 50s were not as tolerant. As no, <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. But anyway, all right. But anyway, so let's talk begins. about 1950s and let's get, get into this a little bit. Oh, we want I to mean, start. I guess, Truman? You, you want to do Absolutely. a little poli- like political things? We could do a little political yeah, things because there's a Truman, shift right? to some conservatism, right? People are like, let's shift from Truman to Ike. Oh, yeah. And then after that, we'll get into like the social stuff. So Basically, Truman's there, right? And he wants to continue the New Deal. Roosevelt yeah. d- dies in office, right? We know that. This is obviously after World War um after World War II, World War II ends five years prior to this. You do have the Korean War that starts in the 50s. That's a future podcast. Um, but what Truman's basically talking about, he wants to continue the New Deal. And he says that every segment of the population has a right to expect a fair deal from the government, right? Mm-hmm. And one thing I always talk about, if you look at, at Truman's fair deal, a lot of it makes sense, right? He wants full employment for everybody. He wants a higher minimum wage. He wants national health care, affordable housing. He wants to increase welfare benefits, and he wants to aid farmers. A lot of these are the same things. If you look at like modern day presidential elections, this is what the platforms are, right? How are they going to increase yeah. employment? How do you, should they should they make the minimum wage higher? You know, you hear that all the time, right? Healthcare, that's always something that's out there. So all this, it's, it's nothing new, really. And this fair deal was basically a government sponsored programs that do this, but this was also going to expand government and people are getting very wary of that now in the 1950s. Yep. yep. And he's facing, he's facing some issues. I, I mean, if you really look into this, you're looking at the idea of the unions. The unions yeah. were, were held in check a lot during World War II. Well, it's kind um, of an agreement, right? Same thing with the an First agreement. World War. Exactly. Like, well, we won't go on strike as long as we're you know promised fair wages and after the war. And Republicans and some Democrats actually were opposed to this fit, the fair deal programs getting passed. But a minimum wage did go up. It went up from 40 to 75 cents an hour. So that's Ooh. big during time. All right. And um, cheaper housing did become available for certain individuals. Um, but most people were, like I said, very wary of giving the government more power. They just wanted peace and gradual prosperity. They were happy the yeah. war was over. So, yeah. and they, like, the prosperity and the, the fruits of the war. You got to remember, if you're looking, you know, over in Europe, Europe is decimated by World War II, destroyed. Yeah. We're not. So, we're able to just, like, kind of like enjoy the spoils of war to a certain degree. There's a lot of things happening here, though, that are positive and negative, along with with these political changes, um, or rather the ability you know, trying to hold on to what is happening. The United States is not the same it was during FDR before World War II. You know, it's coming out of World War II much, much different. 
It's um, coming out as a superpower. That's it. Superpower, right? But there's a few things domestically, like 45 and 46 returning veterans face severe housing shortage. There just isn't enough for them. There is, um, that's how GI bills really gets into, you know, the GI bill gets introduced also to alleviate this idea of, wow, there's all these workers coming back and these jobs are kind of taken already. Like, so what do you do so you don't have massive unemployment? Uh, let's send all these GIs to school, which is, you know, makes us in a sense that makes us a brighter, smarter nation. And the idea but, is also they're in school for a couple of years and then they can get um, white collar jobs instead of just blue collar jobs. They're not just yes. going to work in a factory. They're going to have other like managerial available, positions yep. available to them. Yeah, and they want they did want to help out a lot of these soldiers coming home. Like they're basically saying, you guys helped them in the war. There's got to be the government wants to help you in some way now. Yeah, there's also uh, I started looking at this. There was rising divorce rates directly after World War II because of tensions created because of the war, like changing women and, and male roles. Because so many women entered the workforce and did so many things that usually males did, that there was almost like this rude awakening when these males come back. They're like, "All right, like go back home and you know, cook." Yeah, a lot of the women, a lot of women didn't want to do that. Yeah, they said, like, "No, what? we proved what we could do. We helped again, helped win the war. Where's our you know GI Bill? Where's where's our benefits?" And they didn't, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. They were expected to go home. And start having babies, which we'll yeah, get to, obviously. Which we'll get to. Uh, so most women did leave their jobs, war jobs, and did go home. Uh, they had no but choice. By 19, yeah, by 1950, though, more than one million war marriages had ended in divorce. Um, you know, things didn't quite work out as well as they were supposed to. And going back to, like, strikes overall, like for Truman, um, there was one issue where after the labor unions agreed not to strike during World War II, that was pretty much over. So... As conditions change, you have higher prices, lower wages, uh, 4.5 million you know, upset workers, including steel workers, coal miners. Uh, what I read was railroad workers. They all went on strike in 1946 because they wanted better pay. And Truman actually refused to let these strikes cripple the nation. So he threatened to draft the striking workers um, to make them yeah. soldiers, basically, to stay on the job. And Wasn't that rule something that he couldn't do that, though? Yeah, it didn't quite work out for him that yeah. way. Um, he got, yeah, it didn't work out for him. Um, Truman, uh, yeah, he appeared before Congress and asked for the authority to do so. Congress um, said no. Yeah, and before he could even finish the speech, the union gave in, and they're like, uh-oh. And they well, it scared him. It scared him. But yeah, the, well, again, it goes back to that thing, the public season. They're kind of getting skeptical, like, wow, this government's getting too much power. We just fought a war to get rid of, like, this is, you know, some people, but fought a war against fascism or against these, like, against these, like you know, the government telling us what to do. And now the government's kind of getting, you know, how strong is the government getting? And that's so why they were against a, a lot of those swing. fair deal programs. Yeah. You have the swing. Yeah. Like you're always going to see, especially in a democracy, you're going to get the swing back and forth. So this is the swing. 1946, directly after World War II, congressional elections, the Republican Party wins control of both the Senate and House of Representatives. And Truman um, has very quickly, first of all, in 1947, Congress passes the Taft-Hartley Act um, over Truman's veto. Uh, the bill reduced the strength of organized labor, overturned many rights won by the unions under New New Deal, and basically made this a business, like a company's paradise. Uh, shortly thereafter, Truman um, steps down from his presidency, and he is replaced by the Republican Ike, which kind of starts this, I guess, I wouldn't say it starts the 1950s, but it kind of does, because, I mean, if you think of 1950s, you think... Eisenhower, because Truman's approval rating sank to an all-time low of 23% in 1951. So, like, Truman was done. And when um, Ike takes over, he wins 55% of the popular vote in 1952, uh, the majority of the Electoral College votes, and still captures Congress. So this is now the Republicans' playground, you might say, in 1950s. Uh, we do have to mention that whether this is a Republican thing or a Democrat thing, uh, a lot of this stems from what you mentioned before, Tom, is the fact that Europe is so destroyed that the United States produces most of the things made in the world at this time. Yeah, that's a big thing. That's a big reason. Like Most of the products anyone is buying in the world are being made here. So they're just jobs in factories right now. Yep, absolutely. And this is going to come back to hurt the country later on. But at this point, it's why you're getting this American lifestyle. People are getting well-paid jobs, well-paid factory jobs. It says the Americans were enjoying the highest standard of living in the world throughout 1950s. So like today, everything you look at is pretty much made in China, made in China. It, it was 1950 or 1951. Uh, most of the things you looked at, it said made in the USA. It's hard to believe, but that was, you know, and that was a necessity because um, the producer, the prior producer, Europe was still in shambles. So um, 
a few things that are happening. Organization of man and just organization overall of, of corporations in the United States. A lot of automation increases productivity. So you're starting to get factories that, uh, this is kind of something you alluded to before, Tom. Um, a lot of these companies merge to form larger corporations, but there's also automation with uh, machines and whatnot, which kind of leads to the shift from blue collar jobs or industrial jobs to professional like service jobs. So it kind of switches from, I just work in a factory to press a button to more like I manage this machine because I have some engineering degree. So a lot of these new clerical or managerial jobs are referred to as white collar jobs. There's this switch from blue collar to white collar. Um, another thing I saw during here is that a lot of companies in the 1950s franchising, I mean, probably the most famous story of franchises that stems out of 1950s, obviously it's McDonald's. Today you have nearly 3,000 franchised companies. And they, uh, actually I just saw that one third of all US retail sales today in 2021 come from franchised um, companies, which is something that was new in 1950s. Did you ever read the, or see the story of the guy that bought McDonald's? I, I know of them. And there's a movie that deals with it. I, I remember seeing it. Was, it was uh, Michael Keaton played him. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ray Kroc paid McDonald's two point seven million for the franchise rights to their hamburger drive-in, which they first opened in uh, San Bernardino in California. And the whole thing about McDonald's was that it was like an assembly line method. So this guy bought it for two point seven million, and by in f- April '55 opens up another McDonald's in Illinois, and with the you know famous uh, golden arches. But arches, yeah, and that's it. it becomes McDonald's, like that's yeah, such a yeah, like these guys had this American really great symbol. idea. And then exactly, it be, literally becomes the American symbol. Remember, they're, they're like drive throughs mostly at, at the beginning. The drive-ups, yeah. you get the money. And we'll get to that, what the, how the car and everything like that yeah. and suburban life in the 1950s. So uh, I was, well, I was gonna, even before that, I was going to go to the baby boom. Go. Baby boom was important. You know, the idea about the baby boom, um, basically there's this quote I found from a British uh, visitor to America in 1958. And he says, it seems to me that every other young housewife I see is pregnant, right? And yeah. in 1957... The average is there's one baby born every seven seconds, which is Excellent. huge, which is huge. So the baby boom is basically after World War II, Americans start to get married at a very young age and they start having families. And the birth rate soars, increased 90%, some 30 million people during the 1950s, which is known as the baby boom. These young kids are being um, raised with to have quote unquote real American values. All right, whatever that is, yeah. okay, <laughs> you know, we can look yeah. at some of that. But they're being, and then they're, they're brought up. And this is a large group of people is still a major factor in the United States today because these are the ones that are now slowly starting to retire, right? Have retired, will be retiring over the next decade, and that's going to be the whole Social Security debacle, which you're always hearing about. Yeah. It's, the, yep. it's the baby boomers. Yep. It's direct. And we're not blaming the baby boomers. We're just saying. No, no, but that's just that population. Yeah. That population yeah. because we haven't the, – the population is actually in decline now, I believe. Well, since the baby boom. Yeah. For the most part. Um, that brings on a lot of the suburban living, right? The levy towns. Yeah. And that's kind of like where I, I think we should definitely stick in this area here because, well, first of all, you said like being brought up with these American values. What became really huge was Dr. Benjamin Spock's book, um, Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care, published in 46. That's basically how parents raised their children. It was like these new guidelines. Yeah. Uh, this pediatrician author sold nearly 10 million copies of this book in the 50s. And basically, this is interesting because he advised parents not to spank or scold their children. Um, he encouraged families to hold meetings and like talk to children so they could express themselves. Uh, he also believed that mothers should stay home with their children because he, he thought that was they say the term that, yeah. And also in the and, 50s too, the, the kids were living long. That's a big thing too. In the 50s, they started having more, not all the vaccines and stuff that people get yeah, now. Typhoid, but, uh, polio. But they like were that. able to, infant mortality went down a lot more too during the 1950s. Yeah. So you were, if you had six kids, you know, all six could survive. It was It wasn't like, you know, 1850s where if you have six you're lucky if you're happy if two of them survive to adulthood yeah i mean when there was polio awesome. outbreak and, and we talked about this oh, one they had polio, they had all that stuff, yeah yeah but when you had polio outbreaks the, the fear of the disease caused families to literally like alter daily lives and during outbreaks yeah. they like kept kids from school for weeks like you didn't have to yeah. do that anymore um yeah. also nothing i just saw about baby boom that it really impacted child care and the economy and the educational system like for example in 1958 Toy sales alone reach one point two five billion dollars because the well, baby yeah. boomers. Well, we'll get to that um, in the fifties, yeah, because they realize that now parents have a bit more money than they did before because the work workforce and income changes. 
So because of that, they have a little bit more money. Now they see these like, kids as consumers, that parents want to buy things for their kids. Yep. So they start to market things you know, towards children or towards young babies and stuff like that as far as like, oh, give this to your baby. Your baby needs this. Your child needs this. And if, you know, if you're not a good parent, unless you buy them this. So it's yep. like and they have that disposable income a little bit more. So it creates a whole new era, whole new, I don't want to say era, a whole new market for consumerism in the United States. Yep. There's also a sharp, they say that during the decade, 1950s, 10 million new students entered the elementary schools because of the baby boom. And the sharp increase in enrollment caused massive overcrowding, teacher shortages. But also, like, for example, I saw this um, particular thing in California, a new school opened every seven days during 1958. Yeah, that's what happened. So a lot of these cities, right, are busting at the seams for these reasons, right? Nice. So that creates a, the suburbs. Like yep. Suburbs really don't really see this until the 1950s, this suburban migration, because the workforce and income changes that led to this like geographic mobility for Americans. So most of all these young couples moved to the suburbs, surrounding large cities. And by 1960, I found that 60 million Americans, about one third of the population lived in suburbs. Yep. And that's basically what it is now. Like you and I live in suburbs. Like That's what we do. Like, you know, and like, I, yeah, same thing. I, similar statistic, right? By early 1960, every large city in the United States was surrounded by suburbs, which is yeah, new. That's because of the highway system. That's because of the you know the automobile becoming more prominent. You know. Yep. Um, yeah, they said 13 million new homes were built in 1950s. 85 percent of all these new 50, uh, 13 million homes in a decade were 85 percent of them were built in the suburbs. Just, you know, that was the American dream. I think that's the definition of the American dream. It was like this affordable, single family house, you know, good schools, safe, healthy environment for children to grow up, nice neighbors, just like me. You know what I mean? It was like this, this, this almost like paint, like a painting of this American dream. Yeah, well, you could get some of these um, suburban houses, right, for um, was it about $8,000 with no down payment or pay $60 oh, a month, which is nuts. Yeah. And the house that I saw, the basic, what well, because American dream, suburban living was a one-story house. A 12 by 19 living room. We had two bedrooms, a tiled bathroom floor, big deal, right? Yeah. A garage, a small backyard, and a front lawn, and like a fireplace, washer, dryer, like all that stuff. And this was like, you had this type of house, you're ready to go. And they made these cookie cutter houses. They're all the same, like the levy towns that you saw all yeah. around the country. I mean, even in my old neighborhood, uh, before I moved, when you looked at it down the street, it was literally like maybe four different types of homes. Like you just, the whole block was really just four homes. Like probably it was like, you know, model A, model B, model C, model D, and then go back to model A, model B. <laughs> like, but they were all very similar. You walked into the living room, you flicked a light switch, and it didn't put a light on in the living room. You put the light on in one of the outlets because you had reading lamps. Like it, it, the houses that are built during this time were built for your like typical family of you know one two kids. You know, it was very like Americanized American uh, dream kind of thing. Women's roles, though, I think we should talk about women's roles in the 50s. We alluded to that before, but the role is very similar in that of two like previous uh, previous to World War II, which is you're the homemaker, you're a mother. Yeah. And basically magazines, movies, TV programs, like everything glorified this homemaker mother. Um, Father Knows Best, which I've actually seen some episodes of. And it's a, it's a cool, you know, cute 1950s show. But I mean... It's not supposed to be. It's Father Knows Best is the name of it. And trust me, I've been married for a long time. I can tell you one thing. My wife is the boss and she knows best. Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, same thing. It was all about the mom is the key figure in suburbia, like the thread that weaves between family and community. But the father always knows best, which I think is nuts. And the mother's, but, your job was basically to stay home and be a housewife, yeah. like you said. And like um, they were actually, I like, talked about how like make sure like, when you're coming home, you know when your husband's going to come home, make sure you put on some makeup because he's been at work all day. He wants to see a pretty face. That's what yeah, they're telling the women. You can imagine telling like our wives that today. like Or like don't ask that. You do not tell your husband about your day until he asks about it. You just listen to him because he's, he was busy at work all day. You know, he expects food to be on the table as soon as you come home. And this is what they're telling even like young girls when they're in the school, you know, yep. in the 50s and the 60s. It's, it's, these are your expectations, what you're supposed to do. And it's um, and you can find these videos. We're not making this stuff up. You can you find these like uh, videos that they Students would watch. They're on YouTube. Just look at ads. Even if you just YouTube. Oh, the ads. Uh, oh, the ads. Yeah, the ads. In the yeah, 60s, 1950s, too, the ads sexist, you know, racist ads. I mean, it would be – you had ads of like a man spanking a woman. And it, yeah. like the, it was an ad for coffee. She gave him the wrong coffee. Yeah, they, next, yeah the next coffee time, was burnt. Next time the coffee won't be burnt or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like, what is happening? Um, a number of women working outside the home did start to actually rise steadily throughout the decade. 
Uh, but they didn't go back to necessarily the 1940s World War II jobs. They went, a lot of them, so went into teaching, office supports, nursing, so on and so forth. But uh, so the career opportunities were very limited for women. But by 1960, almost 40% of mothers with children between the ages of 6 and 17 held some form of a paying job. Um, and this kind of transfers over to the 60s and the 70s, but it starts in the 50s. I think it's it was this, and when you study just like female empowerment um, in history, you notice that there's a big shift. Two reasons. One, 1940s uh, kind of showed women that not only something they already knew, that they are able and capable of doing these things, but also that society could acknowledge them at these positions. But also there were so many time-saving house products in 1950s, like toasters, uh, crock pots, um, dishwashers, Vac- vacuums, uh, yeah. washing machines, vacuum. So there's, you know, there's some argument to be made. Uh, and I remember reading this in, in one history book somewhere down the line that women actually had more free time. And it was because of having more free time that women started really kind of thinking up this idea of a, like a female liberation movement, you know, um, yeah, it takes it's place feminism. more in the 60s and 70s, but yep. it's still but it yeah, like, here. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, then, the, yeah, but I found a quote from Time Magazine, right? 1956. It said, The ideal model woman, modern woman, married, cooked, and cared for her family, kept herself busy by joining the local PTA and leading a troop of campfire girls. She entertained her guests in her family's suburban house and worked out on the trampoline to keep her size 12 figure. Oh, God. So that's yeah. what they were expected to do. I don't know what size 12 is. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> Actually, I have no idea. Um, however, I, everything you set up to that size 12, I, I'm pretty sure my wife would not like to live in the 50s. I could tell you that much. Um, but an increasing number of women did attend four-year colleges in the 50s. They said that it was still, though, less than 1920s, which I thought was shocking to me. The percentage of women at college students in 1950s was smaller than 1920s because of what you just mentioned, because of this push to like stay home, stay home, stay home. A Gallup poll in 1962, it was a poll of 2,300 women, right? 90% of them hoped that their daughters would be better educated and would lead different lives than they had. I thought that was crazy. Before we get into the automobile culture, I think the 50s was very much like a leisure time. Uh, you know, you had a lot of kids, you had a lot of leisure time. It was a big reason for television too, right? That's how you're going to yeah, say Yeah, television was huge. And we did that, you know, with our, I talked a little bit about that during our um, card, Saturday cartoons episode. But you have 3D comics, 3D movies. They were like a fads of the 50s. You know, the 50s had their fads. Uh, hula hoops, right? Um, scientific you know, advances that lead to more labor-saving devices. Like I mentioned before, you have your washing machines, uh, clothes dryers, dishwasher, lawn mowers, really. Fortune magazine reported in 1953 that Americans spend more than $30 billion on leisure goods and activities. Coming up on 5-Minute News... I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. Just, I thought it was kind of interesting. They said that in the 1950s, Americans had more leisure time than ever before. For a wide variety of recreational pursuits, right? Active and passive. What became popular is millions of people practiced um, sports, fishing, bowling, hunting, boating, golf. Like These are like your suburbs sports that a lot of people um, practice. Also, more fans than ever in any other decade prior to it attended baseball, basketball, and football games. Well, this is really and, when baseball becomes like, well, it was already national pastime, but it becomes very big in the 50s too. All the sports do. People want to go to these yeah. events. It's because they have what's called like that disposable income. They have a little bit of extra cash. Teenagers have money too. They're getting yeah. part-time jobs, you know, pumping gas, working as waiters and stuff like that. So they have this own money too. So the whole culture just pops out for this teenage culture. I think that's actually in the 50s is when um, the word the word teenager actually yes. gets becomes part of the American language. There was no word or, you know, you would say, oh, this is a young adult, or this is just, you know, Peter. But now in the yeah. in the 1950s, it becomes teenager. And teenagers, um, by 1956, 13 million teens, they spend about $7 billion a year yeah. during this time. They also make so, uh, comic books reach their peak sales in the mid-1950s. 
But it's also it's a rise of juvenile delinquency. You know, this idea in the suburbs, there's really not yeah, much to do for these kids. And especially when, when both parents and that's are showing movies, right? What, um, the Rebel Wild Without one, a Cause. The Wild Without a Cause. Yeah. So these are showing movies, Catching the Rye. All right, these, so right. this idea of juvenile delinquency, like what are we going to do with these kids? Isn't that sim- very similar to this uh, this murder book that I read recently too called The Denville 13? I think that kind of, <laughs> that kind of stuff too, right? Uh, nice right, try. Nice bit. try. She plays, yes, she yes, plays. I know, I know, I know the author of that guy, of that one. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, author's a little bit full of himself, but other than that, it. Um, <laughs> you jerk. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. But also the teams, you had this different thing with teams. You had like the um, I know we got a guy on team coach now. You have the juvenile delinquency. You also have like the the whole idea of like the beat generation, right? These beatniks. You have the clean yep. team versus the beatnik, right? Yep. You have the idea of team culture. They were raised. Remember we talked about those like uh, real American values, supposed to obey the rules, control your emotions, don't make waves, fit in with the group. These are all kind of things you're taught in school. Don't even think about, you know, sex. That was like, you do not yeah. talk about that. Again, that's what you're being taught. They're being told. I don't know how, how much that works for a teenager. but Yeah. Well, a beat movement started in the New York City, right? I think it was in yeah. the village. And they said it, it beat originally meant like weary. Like, you you know, you refer to it as like your expressed social literary dis- nonconformity. You know, that was kind of the idea. Yeah, it was the opposite of the clean teens. The ones that are going to be all like their hair's cut perfectly, parted. They're wearing yeah. like the button up shirt and everything and the beatnik is going to be a little more a little more rag uh, do you ever read on the road by jack it sounds really familiar i'm sure that was something i mean that's else, 1957 probably. that's like the beatnik book Bible. on the road yeah i remember reading it when i was in high school and just not getting it but um automobile culture let's talk about cars because i think that's a huge contributor to 1950s leisure time oh, yeah. but also suburbia and you know a lot of i mean feel like it's the glue that holds it all together here well, just basically, you know, car registrations went from, what, 25 million to over 60 million during this yeah. time. Um, two family cars doubled. Just like the car, people actually had more than two cars, or at least two yeah. cars, from, uh, it started increasing. But the big reason for that is because 1956, right, they have the Interstate Highway Act. It's the yeah. largest public works project in American history. It costs over $32 billion, and it makes over, what, 41 thousand miles, 41 million yeah, miles, 41,000 miles, 41, miles, miles, yeah, miles of new highways built. But the thing I always like to remind the students is that, yeah, these were built for the highway system was great, but really they were built because of the Cold War, right? It was, these, these were I love this made as, yeah, as, if, as if, if you ever drive down on a highway, you have to always say, have that divide the middle, but they're well, always, interstate you know, the right there. Interstate, interstate highways is because these are for mass evacuations B50, for, for B-50. Um, well, yeah, it's for two. They, they get the people out, mass evacuations to, to get the get, get people out of the cities. Right in a way out when a nuclear bomb is coming, and also so that the tanks and the airplanes can land on these also and use them as airstrips and stuff like that for World War Three. You got to remember yeah. the government is still preparing for World War Three at this yeah. time. Yeah, if you look at like the Google Maps of Route 80, for example, that Route 80 every once every few miles it straightens out for a specific length, and yeah, that is that, the yeah. length so that a B 52 bomber could land there in emergency. Like it's designed for B-52 bombers to land every few miles. And also, if you look at underpasses and overpasses and um, on Route 80 and other interstate highways, they have a minimum, a specific minimum underneath clearance so they could hide missile launchers that were designed and built in the 1950s, which is nuts. But also this Highway Act, I mean, it encouraged development of new suburbs further from the cities. Cause, you That's know, true. It allowed it to happen. You didn't have to drive these dirt roads anymore. You hop on the highway, right? 20 minutes, yeah. you're, in your, you're, you're at work. And it becomes this car culture, like what you're saying. And it becomes more of a nation using that. Using that you have the first McDonald's. You said you had the Howard Johnson drive-in movie theaters, yeah. drive-ins. Yeah, motels, stuff like that. restaurants, f- filling stations. You would go um, drive on the highway. That would be a family vacation, right? Yeah. Route, 50, Route 66. Which kind of died out. That was one of the things. Towns that were located along the new highways prospered, while towns that were situated along the older ones um, experienced hard times. Like it just it, – it's interesting how well, the they, highways yeah. almost the determined. Yeah. Yeah. What, but if you think of like – when I think of highway near my town, there's McDonald's, there is Applebee's, there's all these different restaurants and things to do, things to stop, a, a Walmart – but then you realize that that's because that highway goes, someone going across my state goes on a highway. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just for people living in that town. These things that are on highways, these stores and filling stations are really designed for those that are driving across. So more Americans hit the road, right? Mountains, lakes, national parks, historic sites, amusement parks. I mean, Disneyland opens up. We talked about that in July 55, right? It's just the idea of car really 
gets the Americans to go on the road. There's no question about it. Yes, they're doing um, it. It's, it's, it's encouraged. Um, they said that obviously cars also created new problems because of the excess cars. Uh, society for society and for the environment, noise, exhaust, pollution in the air, all that, automobile yeah, yeah. accidents. I mean, claim more lives every year. Traffic jams. That's another one. Like, did you read um, when they build the GW bridge to New York City? Uh, the GW bridge initially, when they were being when it was being built, it literally had like one on it was one level, and it was mostly for railroads. It had like one road on it. By the time they finished building it, they realized, oh, no, there's more cars. So they switched it to like one railroad or two railroads and mostly lanes for cars. And by 1950s, there were so many cars in the road that they actually attached the lower level to the garden, um, to the George W., uh, George Washington Bridge in New York City. They realized, the engineers realized that the bridge could handle it. So they just hung the lower portion of that bridge onto the existing bridge because of the amount of cars. Yeah, you ever try driving the George Washington Bridge? They should add another level to it. You really should add another level. Because <laughs> you're just stuck on, yeah, I don't know. It's I just... always prefer, I, for some reason, I always prefer to go on a lower level. I don't know why. You have this massive consumerism. Think of it this way. Americans have more money. They're living in the suburbs. They have a nice small American house dream. and a nice pickle face. The American dream. That by 50s, 60% of Americans were members of the middle class. Now, this is an interesting point because that means 40% were not. However, 60 were, right? Um, that is twice as many middle class Americans as before World War II. So that shows you this growth. Also, consumerism becomes huge. Like buying material goods becomes equated with success, right? So new products. And you and I kind of talked about it before we click record today. Besides the idea of you know high school appliances and dryers, blenders, freezers, dishwashers, so on, televisions, tape recorders, new high fidelity record players, um, barbecue grills, swimming pools, lawnmowers, you name it. But also a lot of these products started to become designed, purposely designed to become obsolete because cor- corporations wanted you to like wear that stuff out so you could buy something new. Yeah, and they weren't – Yeah, they, that happens more and more later on too. But the idea was yeah, they're not going to make things you – know, I think they don't make it like they used to. And mm-hmm. That's true and that was almost – that was on purpose because they realized if we make it that it's never going to break down or it's, you're not going to have to replace it after a couple of years – then that's the, that's the end of their company. If you don't need a new toaster, you're not going to buy a new toaster. It's one of those things. First credit card, right? The Dinners Club issued the first credit card in the 1950s, and the American Express card was introduced in 1958. So you have the beginning of credit cards. And the, uh, they carried really high fees, and so they were limited to middle-class Americans. But overall, I mean, you had installment plans. Uh, you have mortgages and automobile loans. So during the decade, a total private debt grew from $73 billion to $179 billion so instead of saving money americans were just like spend 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 money 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 you know um because they had this idea that this prosperity was going to you know continue really i mean it would always last yes. um so do you have anything else that kind of deals with like well the, the happy-go-lucky 50s or should we get into some like the well yeah i was getting into a little more um before we get into some of the c- civil rights stuff yeah um but we talked about a little bit the fear of the cold war and the russians and i think we can't do a Brief one on the 50s without talking about Sputnik. Of course. So this is a huge, important thing. Basically, Sputnik is the first um, um, man-made satellite, right? Sputnik 1 to orbit the Earth. Um, Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union fires it up into space in 1957. It circles the globe several times, about 18,000 miles per hour. And a lot of people were really worried about this when it was first passed over the United States. It was going to drop bombs. This thing was small. Nobody was carrying bombs. But it really... It starts off the space race, basically, and it also puts into place the National Defense Education Act, which is basically how the government is going to spend money to fund education in math and science. And it's when yes. because they, want, they want scientists, they want engineers. We got to outpace the Soviets. We got to make sure that we uh, do that. And it creates a whole bunch of um, science fiction, you know, ideas. Basically, Hollywood uses aliens as metaphors for communist, right? Yes. Wall of the world invasion. Watch out! And it's it's not they're not saying communist, they're not saying Soviet Union. But that's basically what they're implying in a lot of these movies. Yeah. And you have a lot of these families are, I mean, you have this fear of, oh, yeah. of a duck nuclear cover. attack. So it's a duck and cover generation. Duck and cover drills, right? Like Bert, you know, the turtle, he has a shell on his back, but you don't. So duck and cover. Yeah, um, which would do nothing, by the way. We're not trying with, no. like, if you're duck and cover on a desk and a bomb goes off, a nuclear weapon goes off, you're just going to yeah, be. You're, yeah, you're but I, you I know mean, what? I guess if you're far enough away, it's going to. At the same time, it gave so. kids. It was one to make people feel good. But I mean, unless you have a refrigerator, make people feel exactly. Safe. Unless you have a refrigerator, like uh, like Indiana Jones. And yeah, the latest well, that's movie. just Indiana Jones. 
Well, South Park did a funny yeah. thing on it years ago. South Park's everything, but there was like worried about a volcano going off, and they were like, they showed the video, like if you just duck and cover and show the lava just going over the kids. So then later on in the episode, <laughs> the lava, the volcano does go off, and then like Kenny ducks and covers, and it just burns him alive because lava is oh not going to just like travel over you if you duck, just like ducking, covering outside. It's not going to do anything when you see a flash from a nuclear weapon. Oh my god! So but, <laughs> that's terrible. Yes. Anyway, that, that is terrible. <laughs> uh, There's a lot of Cold War tensions. Right. Yes, cold water. and people would build actual like shelters oh, in shelters. their homes, yeah. like fallout shelters. You know, that was that was. Part you have in schools. I mean, if your school was built older on, you can probably see. I mean, my high school still had the fallout shelter sign. Yeah, like, ours down as by well. The, by the steps, yeah, like here's your fallout shelter, right down there. Is it insane how things have changed? Um, yeah. So I mean, again, 1950s, uh, and we talked a little bit about this in our other podcasts in the morning once, but we talked about morning cartoons, but. Um, when you look at television, television becomes huge. It's a, it's a huge pastime in the 1950s as you're sitting in a nice little one-family home in suburbia. Um, and a lot of critics objected to the effects of, on children, right? As stereotypical portrayals of women, minorities, as I mentioned before, father knows best. Uh, male characters always outnumber women characters three to one, actually, throughout 1950s shows. The programs portrayed primarily white, middle-class suburban experiences. Uh, if African-Americans and Hispanics rarely appeared in televisions in the 1960s. Um, it was definitely much like, very much like an idealized white America, which I think would be a good transition to come into like the not so happy 1950s. Yeah, especially um, for people of um, yeah, uh, yeah, minorities like and, and African Americans in particular. The, yeah, it start you start the desegregation of American society, but in the early 1950s, there was over 15 million African Americans, and two thirds of them made their homes in the South, and they had you know, obviously we talked about this before, they had the Jim Crow laws, right? It's yep. basically a set of rigid laws which govern all aspects of their existence. Um, they kept them insulated from whites, economically inferior to them, politically powerless. Um, everything had to be separated. And basically, only during this time span in the 1950s, at least the beginning of the 1950s, only 20% of all eligible African Americans actually did vote. So there was very okay. few even involved in the um, process. You have those same things like the colored entrance. You know, you, you've seen them all. You've seen these pictures. There's yep. people actually living through it. And that changes a lot in 1952. When the NAACP supported a group of legal challenges to, to segregation in public schools, came before the Supreme Court, and probably the most um, well-known of Supreme Court cases that I think all high school students know is Brown versus Board of Education. Well, they also talk about this idea of like white flight. I mean, that's something that, that we yeah. teach. You know, there are a lot of the rural poor were migrating to inner cities. Um, you know, while rural poor were migrating to cities, a large segment of population was moving out of. So middle-class white Americans started to leave cities for the suburbs, which is something we mentioned before. Uh, and But what's important here is that these white Americans took with them like economic resources and really kind of s isolated themselves from other races and classes that remained in the cities. So the urban crisis prompted a white flight, um, had a direct impact on poor whites and non-whites, but really uh, the cities lost people and businesses. they lost taxes on, on property residents that owned and income taxes they had paid. So essentially it created this idea of like an inner city. They could no longer really afford, city governments could no longer afford um, to properly maintain or improve schools, public transportations, police, fire departments, like the urban poor, and most of them were African-American, suffered because of this white flight. Well, I mean, this is, keep on that, obviously you had Brown versus Board Education, right? Make segregation yeah. illegal in public schools. Um, Many states are very slow to do that. Um, Truman does do some stuff for civil rights, right? He does yeah. actually, he calls for the securities, right? He ends segregation in the um, military. Yeah. Um, and he wanted to do it other, but Congress resisted passing any civil rights administration. And then Eisenhower really showed no interest in it. It's not till, yeah. not till Kennedy starts and then obviously his assassination sparks. That's a whole other thing. You have Little Rock Nine. I mean, that's something we can do an entire podcast on. I don't, I want to give them a, um, yeah, that's a Talk about no, it, should, but basically, yeah, that should be a podcast. That should just be a podcast. But obviously, you know, the governor sent the National Guard to prevent them from entering the school for three weeks. So then, they send in the uh, the Eisenhower does get involved here, and he actually sends in a thousand federal troops to escort the girls to class to enforce yeah. Brown versus the Board of Education. Yeah. So 1950s, uh, you know, is not just this peachy time. I mean, we're having no, some no. massive. Social it's Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's the beginning of the civil rights movement, hardcore. A lot of times you yeah. think of probably the sixties as a civil rights movement, but it starts like the Montgomery bu bus boycott. Martin Luther King was chosen as spokesperson for Bob for that boycott. That's all starts in what fifty five. Crazy. You, know, you have the Civil um, Rights Act of fifty seven, which was a federal bill which um, to 
made it federal crime to prevent a qualified person from voting. So you definitely hear doubt about that a lot now, too. Wow. And a lot of Americans kind of refuse to, like, especially people that move to the suburbs, they refuse to believe or were kind of unaware of, like, the decaying inner cities and, yeah, and like, aware of it. racial that, injustice. That'll change with, yeah, that'll change with right. television. Yep. In, in areas of the United States that they're not accustomed to. Um, and then uh, Michael Harrington published in 1962 The Other America, Poverty in the United States. And it kind of showed that not only he confirmed the fact that we have widespread poverty in the United States, but how brutal it was. And, you know, this is the most powerful nation on earth, having a, a massive poverty problem. But it's also this poverty that leads to activism. You know, um, Mexicans are seeking employment, um, African-American civil rights movement, uh, other minorities begin to develop like political awareness and the voice trying to basically get some form of activism going um, to to go against this flawed, right? perception of this uh, peachy all you know glamorous america and people because start to realize this right right so it's like Absolutely. time passed more and more people start to these young people uh, start to stray from their views of their parents they question if the country is doing enough for you know civil rights where they were against nuclear weapons they were unsure if communism was such a bad thing really after all you start having that so it creates that counterculture is what leads to the counterculture of the 60s and 70s yeah right you, you the Going against the that counterculture space, are going against the ideas that were, they were brought up in, in the fifties. Yep. So it's interesting, I, um, you know, you, you, know, you can't have the sixties and seventies without what the fifties are first. Agreed. I um, rock and roll. I mean, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm sorry about the teen generation, Elvis. Absolutely. Right. That, that we should have kind of mentioned. That we talked about the teens. I mean, rock and roll. Teenagers kind of have obviously we said 1950s teenagers become recognized as like important and unique developmental stage, you know, between childhood and adulthood. But, and that's also because so many of the late fifties, you're talking a lot of these baby boomers are, are becoming um, of age, but Presley becomes the unofficial king of rock and roll. Um, and the term was uh, coined by a Cleveland DJ, right? Alan Freed yep. was a, supposedly the first person to call it rock. He, he was calling it rocking and rolling music. And it yep. became shortened to rock In and 1951, roll. Cleveland, Ohio. And it was interesting because the audience of that radio station was mostly white, but the music that um, was usually produced by African-American musicians, which is kind of where this idea of grew out of rhythm and blues and country and pop, like that's essentially what rock and roll was, um, which I, again, it, it became huge. I mean, it became Elvis, which another, that could be a podcast in itself, um, kind of exemplified what it meant to be a teenager in 19, um, you know, 1950s. You want so you got some fun facts from uh, 1950s that well, we talked about a lot of them, but yeah, you obviously have things like Barbie makes her debut during this time period. Yeah, um, the Ben Hur was released that won a, a total of 11 Academy Awards until uh, with, Titanic. Oh, look, Titanic, Titanic also won it. 11. I know, I think it also won 11, tied it. Um, what do you call it? Uh, Alaska and Hawaii become the 49th and 50th states in 59. Yes. They haven't had any states since that time, right. right? And Mount Everest was uh, climbed for the first time. The ascent, okay. the Mount Everest. Now you hear that now it's like so many people go there all the time that it's like become like sex polluted. There's like, really? There's like Coke cans all over the mountain. Yeah, I was reading articles hmm. about that. Uh, 1953, The Old Men in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway receives the Pulitzer Prize. Huh. You have TV dinners were introduced in the 1950s? Yes, they were. Convenient it's been frozen such a meals long time a big thing. Since I had a TV dinner. Oh, like the Hungry Man and stuff? Yeah, the Hungry <laughs> so Man. College, I'd be like a tree. Oh, I'm going to Hungry Man today. And you, like, That's a big one. If you so look you, at the nutritional value of this thing. Oh, if you look at it now, but it's like, terrible. oh, man, if I, if I, the sodium, like, oh, my God, <laughs> I would be, I'd be dead now. Oh, but, yeah, you know, when too. you're, yeah, my, when you're uh, 20, you can handle it. Not yeah, so my much 30, 20. Uh, my upper 30. Not so much 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, not going to work. Um, RCA broadcast the first ever color television program, 1951. Also, Twilight Zone beca- begins era in 1915. I love the Twilight Zone. Yes. Rod Sterling's Twilight Zone. That's that's some uh, good stuff. Yeah, the Muppets debut during this time. Oh, like, really? I didn't the, know that. It was 50s. They, they debut. They, you don't see them, not the Muppet show, but they do have like, you know, some of the individuals, 1955. Mm. Gas costs 18 cents per gallon at the start of 1950s and 25 cents per gallon uh, by the end of the decade. So it went up seven cents. I guess percentage wise, that's a decent amount in ten years. That's equivalent of value of dollar ninety to two sixteen per gallon, respectively, today. 
Uh, Dr. Seuss published his landmark book, The Cat in the Hat, in 57. Average annual salary of U.S. was $3,210 in 1950 and $5,010. That's average annual salary by 1959. Yeah. yeah. And we had, That's crazy. This is the idea of the, of the consumer, right? The first, um, the first mall, modern mall, opens up in Minnesota on October 8th. Wow. They have escalators, like that kind of modern mall design. The Wizard of Oz comes to TV for the first time in 1956. NASA has created 58. See, something new. Uh, they said an average co- cost of a new car was $1,510 in 1950, which is about 16000 in today's money. I Love Lucy ranked consistently as number one every year it aired from 51 to 57. That's interesting. I love I Love Lucy. Still a big fan. I believe they're making a new movie with that. Like about really? Lucille Ball. Yeah, it's, I forget who's playing her. But her daughter, I like, gave it her blessing, and it was a, a big deal. Mm. But yeah, so that's the 1950s. I mean, obviously, we skimmed over a lot of things there. Yeah. We're, we're not going to get to all of it. This is like, if you're teaching the 1950s, it's broken up into a bunch of many different things. It kind of gave like a quick overview. Obviously, we skimmed over the science, and we didn't even talk about uh, Eisenhower that much, really, but like yeah, uh, yeah. the creeping socialism and things like that. There's a lot more we could have gone into with civil rights, obviously. Um, but these are just, this is just going to give you like a brief overview of some of the things that happened in the decade and the fact that it does – you don't have that counterculture of the 60s unless they have that culture to begin with to counter of the 50s. Yep. So you know when you're out there and you're like me and you're like, man, I wish I could live in a simpler times like 1950s. Maybe it wasn't really that simple. And I, maybe I no. should – Every time has its own difficulties, its own – and it's on positive. You know, I'm not saying the 50s were a horrible time. No, it sounds like they were um, pretty cool, but it was they were also like kind of not. But it, just because they say it seems good for one group of people doesn't mean it's good for everybody. And that's something that I think it gets um, glossed over a lot of times from if you're just reading a textbook. Yes, indeed. Anyway, so thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in once more. We really appreciate your support. If you need to contact us, you could find us at historyteacherstalkingpodcast.com. And Check for us on Twitter, too. Pretty much it. Yeah, just find us. We're there. Just We're us. around. We're yes. around. So, everybody, enjoy, and I'll see you guys next week. Stay safe, everybody. I hope everyone enjoyed our podcast, and if you would like to email us, you can do so at historyteacherspodcast at gmail.com. The Battle of Waterloo was one of the most famous turning points in world history. But what happened next? My name's David Montgomery, and I'm the host of The Siecla, a history podcast that tackles exactly that. Join me as I cover France's overlooked century in between Napoleon and World War I. The Siecle, spelled S-I-E-C-L-E, is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and can be found wherever you get podcasts.